Well, hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Guy Stevens. I'm the founder and executive director of the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint. Uh, I started the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint to raise awareness about the issue and the use of restraint and seclusion in schools across the nation. Our mission is to educate the public, connect people who are dedicated to changing minds, laws, policies, and practices so that restraint and seclusion are reduced and eliminated in schools across the nation and beyond. Our vision is to see safer schools for students, teachers, and staff. Of course, we've got a, a much wider uh, interest as well in many issues, uh, if you've been following us here. And today we're very excited to have Shane Neumeyer and Lydia XZ Brown joining us for a special presentation. Uh, we're gonna be taking your questions following the presentation today. So feel free to post those in the chat as you have questions, and we'll get to those uh, at the end of the presentation. I do wanna let you know that today's event is being recorded. It will be available on Facebook and on YouTube. We also make it available as an audio podcast if you'd like to listen and download at your convenience. So before we introduce our guest, I want to introduce someone very special here. And I wanna to introduce to you uh, my co-host, Jennifer Litton-Tid. Uh, hey, Jennifer. Jennifer is a wife and mother of four wonderful sons, two of whom are, are autistic and a 30-year political activist who makes the world more inclusive and just for more people. Uh, Jennifer is also ADHD and dyslexic. Uh, she has lobbied on state and federal uh, levels and organized rallies, civil disobedience, committed to societal change, and still believes we live in a system where people have great power. Uh, Jennifer is our Director of Advocacy here at the Alliance Against Seclusion Restraint, uh, handles a lot of our social media, does a lot of the amazing memes that you see. And I'm very proud to have Jennifer not only as a colleague, but as a friend. Hey, welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. And I'm excited to introduce our two amazing guests. Um, Shane Newmeyer is a lawyer, activist, and community organizer, as well as an out and proud member of the disabled, trans, queer, and asexual communities. Their passion on the issue of ending abuse and neglect of youth with disabilities in schools and treatment facilities stems from their own experiences with involuntary medical treatment and bullying and led them to go to law school. They have pursued their goal of using legal advocacy to address these problems ever since. Shane's work appears in autistic activism and the neurodiversity movement. Stories from the front lines, resistance and hope, Crip Wisdom for the People, Rewire News and Loud Hands Autistic People Speaking. Uh, Association's Outstanding Young Lawyer in 2018 and the Self-Advocacy Association of New York State Self-Advocate of the Year in 2017 and the Association of University Centers on Disabilities Leadership in Advocacy Award E in 2015. When not working, they're probably crafting, playing Dungeons and Dragons, listening to history podcasts, or watching Netflix with their partner and three feline roommates an amazing life. And Lydia XZ Brown is a disability justice activist, organizer, educator, attorney, strategist, and writer whose work has largely focused on interpersonal and state violence against multiple, multiple, multiply, multiply marginalized disabled people living at the intersections of race, class, gender, sexuality, nation and language. They are policy counsel for the Privacy and Data Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology, adjunct lecturer in disability studies for Georgetown University's Department of English and director of policy, advocacy and external affairs at the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network. They are also founder and volunteer director of the Fund for Community Reparations for Autistic People of Colors Interdependence, Survival and Empowerment. Currently, they serve as a founding board member of the Alliance for Citizen Directed Supports, presidential appointee to the American Bar Association's Commission on Disability Rights and chair of the American Bar Association's Section on Civil Rights and Social Justice Disability Rights Community. Just amazing, amazing, two amazing women. 
Absolutely. So, so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, really, you, you, you've got both amazing backgrounds and done so many um, incredible things. And we're really excited to have you here. Of course, you know, and, and Lydia, you, you and I had a chance to talk previously, but you know, the work that we're doing is, is very focused on restraint and seclusion. But beyond that, uh, uh, in to really the direction of all the other things that are being done to people. And I say done to people, um, you know, because we're, we're looking at a lot of, um, you know, a lot of compliance based and very, um, very damaging practices. Um, and of course, I know you've been involved with things like, uh, you know, the Judge Rotenberg Center and, and other areas like that. Uh, and these are things that have to change. So we're really excited and honored to have you both here to uh, present for us today. And uh, at this point, I just want to thank you. And we will uh, let you begin your presentation, and Jennifer and I will disappear into the background uh, mm -hmm. so that the audience is able to to listen to you. And we will join you as you wrap things up. So just if you can just give us a, a word when you're done, uh, we'll join you back for questions that people might have. So thank you both so much for taking time to do this. This is Lydia. Thank you so much for inviting us and for hosting us. As we get started, go ahead. Oh, yes, thank you for having us. Um, so I'm going to let Guy and Jennifer disappear. Absolutely. And if you need anything, uh, we're, we're here and, and listening in the other room. Uh, so we'll be happy to pop back in. So if anything, if anything unexpected happens, let us know and take it away. Uh, as we get started, I want to invite everyone to take a few moments and to consider the space and the environment that you are in. This is an invitation for you to move or take up space in the way that feels the most comfortable for you, in the way that makes your body mind feel the least in pain, the least overwhelmed, the least stressed out. Wherever you would prefer to be sitting, lying, standing, moving, or pacing, you are welcome to be in that place. And we invite you to make use of your space in the way that makes sense the most for what your body and mind need at this time, whatever that is. And particularly if that involves cuddling a floof, a kitty or a doggo. And uh, if you have them, we always want to see them. I'm sure you can post pictures to the comments on Facebook. And we would absolutely peruse that thread later. Um, Jennifer gave a great introduction of us. Just a quick correction. Uh, neither of us are women. We go by they, them pronouns. Shane also goes by am pronouns. Uh, we are nonetheless happy to be here. Uh, you already know quite a bit about us. But we'll just share briefly, I will, and Shane will. Um, we've been involved in doing advocacy against the Judge Rotenberg Center and other forms of institutionalization and abuse for a very long time, for over a decade, I think, for both of us. And so we bring that background with us here. You can read more about our historical work on the JRC and other activism against it coming out of the autistic community in the book community and the neurodiversity movement edited by Stephen Cap. Uh, Shane? I'm, I'm sorry, it, was there a, a question or um, I'm a little bit confused as to what you would like me to say at this point? Oh, this is Lydia. Uh, if there was anything else you wanted to add an introduction. Um, nope, um, I think we're good, thanks. Cool. Um, What's really fun is when people just ask me to introduce myself, but they put me on the spot and then I just stare blankly and I'm like, uh, I'm Lydia and uh, I guess I'm here. I do stuff sometimes as well as things once in a while. With people sometimes. <laughs> Except um, not in coronavirus. Not in coronavirus generally. So... I want to start our conversation off tonight by talking about ableism and what ableism is, because it foregrounds and provides the groundwork for everything else that we're going to talk about tonight. For those who are new to the concepts who haven't heard ableism in the past, ableism is defined often as discrimination or prejudice about, about, uh, about disabled people and people with disabilities. But to understand it fully, we need to understand ableism as systemic, systematic, structural, and institutional oppression of disabled people. Ableism is a system of power relations, wherein people whose body minds are considered healthy, whole, 
functional, sane, strong, stable, and intelligent are granted enormous political, social, economic, and cultural power at the direct expense of people whose body minds are instead considered sick, broken, defective, deficient, disordered, weak, unstable, crazy, or dumb. Ableism is a system of power relations that teaches us which kinds of people are valuable, worthy, and desirable, and which kinds of people instead are expendable and disposable. Ableism teaches us which kinds of people ought to be allowed to exist, to live, to breathe, to take up space, and which kinds of people should instead be eliminated and prevented from ever coming into existence again. Ableism is a value system. Ableism teaches us who counts as a full human being and who is less than human or not even human at all. Who deserves to be cared for and supported and to have their needs considered legitimate and valid? And who instead deserves to be discarded, kicked when they're down, or to have anything whatsoever done to them, so long as it's in the name of treatment and helping? And so ableism affects disabled people across the lifespan in every aspect of our lives, and it particularly falls most burdensomely on disabled people who live at the intersections of multiple forms of marginalization, because ableism is rooted in, interconnected with, necessary for, and dependent upon every other form of oppression. Ableism is part of the belief that people who are women shouldn't be considered legitimate or believed or trusted because women are supposed to be hysterical, emotional, and irrational. That's the logic of ableism. Ableism is embedded in the idea that queer, trans, and asexual people are sick or defective, that we need to be like treated with therapy or surgery or something to fix us, to make us straight and cis and to be a binary gender. And that if we don't go through those things, then it's our fault if we experience oppression. That's very deeply ableist logic. And ableism is profoundly embedded into racism and white supremacy in the belief that all people of color Black, brown, indigenous, Latinx, Asian, and mixed race people, all of us who are negatively racialized, that we are intellectually or physically inferior to white people. That is literally the logic of ableism. So ableism shows up in all of our systems, in all of parts of our society, and yet even in disability communities, we often don't have a full understanding of what ableism is and how it shows up, especially in disabled movement spaces. Even though ableism is connected to all forms of oppression because it is a system of values about bodies and minds. So I wanna turn it over now um, for a bit less of this very background piece on what ableism is to Shane. And Shane's going to talk to you more about what some of these connections are and how they show up. Um, Lydia was talking about how um, one of the aspects of ableism, and this isn't just ableism, but it also plays out in a ageism, um, especially against both young children or adolescents and elders, um, especially elders with um, age-related disabilities. Um, and also members of other marginalized communities, including, for instance, intersex people and trans people and um, basically members of the entire LGBTQ, et cetera, community. Um, if something can be done in the name of treatment, it is considered acceptable and or even required or functionally socially expected. Um, and in the context of what we're talking about tonight, um, there, there are many situations in which this shows up, but for these purposes, a lot of the interventions we'll be talking about are in the form of um, behavioral treatment or um, so-called treatment, as it were. A, a lot of this starts out um, 
taking uh, picking up whether we're talking about conversion therapy or aversives um, in the use of people with in, in the um, in aversives used in the treatment of people with disabilities. Um, a lot of this takes up in the mid 20th century, right as we're starting to see deinstitutionalization um, to a significant degree, obviously not to as much of a degree as might be great, but people coming into the communities not being written off as these eternally hopeless cases who can just be warehoused and sterilized, etc. But um, as people moved in at the same moment, we're seeing this rise in behaviorism as a therapy. And that comes not only from um, the studies or theories of uh, pioneers in the behaviorism field, people like, for instance, B.F. Skinner. He's not the only one, but he's the biggest name for uh, in the field of some of what we're going to talk about. Um, his ideas are that it's not so much about what's internally in your head, it's an input and output system. Uh, your behavior is shaped by what comes in, you act and people react and that changes how you react the next time or don't react as it were. And it doesn't take into account some of the things that, uh, for instance, might be intrinsic to a person, to their biology, to the ways in which their experiences have shaped them over time into a rounder person. It's more about uh, what you do in reaction to feedback coming in, what you output as uh, um, in response. I'm not summing it up uh, perfectly, but for our purposes, that's what we'll go with. Um, and it wasn't just these theorists and um, psychologists coming out, but a lot of interest in behavior modification uh, in the political field as well. Um, the interest in and arguably hysteria over the phenomenon of brainwashing um, is another place where it plays out, and that led to research on the government level about how can we change a person, including putting an entire different personality in them by things like depriving them of sleep or food or making them stand up in an uncomfortable position for hours on end or putting them in a sensory deprivation chamber. How can we make people be and do what we want? Um, so that is kind of coming together. And then we have... Um, a simultaneous current of these um, utopian communities. Some of them become cults. Um, I'm thinking things like Synanon, for instance, which started out as an AA or uh, Alcoholics Anonymous spinoff and became a thing of people basically controlling each other and attacking each other in these um, in some circles, um, they're called self-criticism sessions, but a similar thing of people calling each other out, criticizing each other in these long drawn out sessions at night to change each other's behavior and control and monitor each other. And at first, some of this is voluntary, at least for the adults. But over time, it becomes less about people choosing to do this and more people stuck there. Now, you may be wondering, how is any of that relevant? It is in the context of the Judge Rotenberg Center, because Matthew Israel, the founder of the Judge Rotenberg Center, um, which is the only facility in the United States known to use electric shock as a form of punishment on people with um, disabilities, he studied under B.S. Skinner, and he went on to form three of these communities, hoping to shape them into um, B.F. Skinner's vision as laid out in the book Woven Two of a behaviorist run utopian society. Unfortunately for him, uh, nobody wanted to live in his ideal society where he controlled everybody, set the conditions, made people act according to what he thought they, sh they should do and be like. So um, he went and formed a school, so-called, for people with disabilities, starting with a few people with psychosocial disabilities and eventually incorporating more people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and then moving on to um, the population of people who um, are young people with so-called behavioral disorders, um, 
who are not doing well in school, for instance, who are acting out, who are aggressive, more almost into the juvenile justice population, which Lydia will talk about uh, um, later in the presentation. Um, and this is not the only program the JRC to use aversives, which aversive interventions or aversives are uh, interventions that cause pain or discomfort to a person to try to force them to change their behaviors. It's particularly notorious because of its use of electric shock, but his is one example. He doesn't even start with electric shock. His program earlier on looks somewhat like some of the other programs, not exactly, but has the food deprivation element of it, for instance, the extensive use of restraints um, as another. At the same time, all these other programs um, of what people might call the troubled teen industry, boot camps, wilderness programs, um, therapeutic or emotional growth boarding schools, start up from that path of synonym to a few other programs and eventually into these quasi-professional organizations that are providing tough love as a means of intervention for young people, usually not the same um, population JRC is working with, uh, generally whiter and richer, and also people who are more um, dealing with addiction and learning disabilities than, say, somebody with, a, uh, with an intellectual disability or an autistic person. Uh, but these use some of the same shaming tactics that grew out of um, the, not only the cults and, idea, uh, and utopian communities of the, the 60s, 70s era, but also some of the inspirations for the behavioral experiments by the government that were drawn from, unfortunately, I say this as a leftist, leftist communities around the world that use self-criticism as a means of controlling and monitoring each other. So this is the milieu in which it's happening, and I could go on about this for ages. Uh, one more strand of this I'll bring in, though, is a guy called Ober, uh, Ole, Ole Ivor Labas, um, a Norwegian immigrant to the United States um, who came to the U.S. and studied behavior modification, pioneered what's called the uh, Applied Behavior Analysis, which is considered right now the, the gold standard evidence-based treatment for autism. Um, but in, back in the day when he was doing it, it involved the same things that JRC was doing, up to and including electric shock. If you Google him and um, his treatment of autistic people, you'll find a picture of him leaning down into a child's face and shouting, and it's called Scream, Slaps, and Love, about this treatment mod modality he employs. Um, he later repudiated this, um, but not before um, he worked on another study um, called the Sissy Boy Project, um, along with George Rakers, who was one of the pioneers of conversion therapy. This was about making a young boy who um, was gay and gender nonconforming act more manly um, by making his parents give out blue tokens, which could be traded into for rewards when the young boy, I think he was five, acted in a manly way and giving red tokens when he acted effeminate and physically punishing him for the number of red tokens that he had. Um, this was a, as um, the, the people who conducted the study, the boss and rakers considered a success uh, and led to version, further conversion therapy, as it, so it's called on uh, gay and lesbian youth um, and unfortunately transgender youth as well um, as time went on and that became more visible. Um, but people don't realize that these two, two um, modalities are intertwined. They're based on the same theory of young people who are nonconforming must be made the same, including punishment. People have said often in the defense, well, ABA isn't like that anymore. That doesn't happen. Unfortunately, they're wrong, for one thing. Um, there are many horror stories about aversives, including soft aversives, things that most people don't think 
would be harmful, but in the context of somebody with a sensory aversion, that's known, it is abusive, or alternately, there are actual cases such as a young child being left in a pile of their own vomit as a consequence for puking up something that they had a sensory aversion to. There are actual abuses, and this goes back to the fact that the primary purpose of all of these interventions is to make somebody conform to an idea of what they should be that somebody else has imposed on that and that considers that end result of making them something else more important than the immediate effect on the person and what it's going to do to them over time uh, and not considering why they might be like that why that might be valid and how to help them meet their own goals on their own terms um, with that background, I will turn it back over to Lydia. Um, and um, yeah. Unfortunately, the history of institutionalization and the history of incarceration are long, violent, and inescapable. For those of us who are at the margins of the margins, we have always experienced coercion, institutionalization, and incarceration as deeply intertwined. Going back to talking about ableism, right? Incarceration and institutionalization serve a very specific purpose, which is to remove people deemed undesirable, contaminant, threatening, or destabilizing from the rest of society. A way of trying to control us, contain us, and manage us, of finding who are the people that are socially undesirable and how can we remove those people from the rest of society? How can we allegedly protect society from the people that we've decided are scary because of race, gender, sexuality, age, disability, religion, or any other number of possible reasons manufactured within the confines of the society in which we live? You can look to the whole history of prisons as institutions used to target people on the basis of class. The existence of the workhouse as an institution where impoverished people were sent to have labor literally exploited and extracted out of them, and sometimes up to and including the point of death. The institution of chattel enslavement targeting Black enslaved Africans and their descendants for resource and labor extraction, for forcible reproduction solely to produce capital, and embedded deeply with ideas of ableism. There are a lot of folks whose work goes deep into the history of ableism and chattel enslavement of enslaved Black Africans. Folks like Talila Lewis and Dustin Gibson have outlined in great detail the many ways in which the institution of enslavement depended upon ableist diagnoses and concepts of people who were enslaved as psychiatrically unstable and as intellectually inferior to those who were not enslaved, to white slaveholders. Um, we can look to the creation and the expansion of the native residential boarding school system in Canada, as well as in the United States, as a means of controlling and coercing native youth and children to erase culture, to erase language, and as a means of pathologizing native existence. My friend Jess Cowing writes a lot about this. It's pretty awesome. Uh, you, should, you should understand the role of psychiatrization abroad and domestically in responding to political resistance and dissent, whether that is in nations outside of where the United States is or within the United States itself, of literally psychiatrizing everybody from native and black and Puerto Rican resistance and nationalist movement leaders to psychiatrizing people outside the United States as psychotic, as crazy, as schizophrenic, merely for resisting empire, occupation, and imperialism, and we can look to the self-perpetuating cycle of disability that it and ableism within our carceral, educational, and medical systems in the United States, where black and brown disabled youth, particularly queer and trans black and brown disabled youth, remain at most risk for removal from school, for arrest, for punishment, for restraint and seclusion, for any manner of aversive intervention, including by the statistics collected by the U.S. Department of Education itself. And in all of those venues, we understand that separation of families, whether in immigration prisons or through penal institutions, 
that constant surveillance and criminalization, that impoverishment, that bullying are all forms of violence that inflict trauma individually, interpersonally, as well as collectively at the community level and intergenerationally. And trauma itself is a disability. Not enough people understand that. Trauma is itself a disability. And every form of disability, right, when you collapse it all together, disability itself is more prevalent in every marginalized community than in every analogously privileged or resourced community. That is in large part because of resource and labor extraction and exploitation and because of deliberate and willful infliction of trauma and violence on our communities. And so the Judge Rotenberg Center as an institution is not a unique place, right? We like to talk about it like it is, like there's no other institution like it. It is the only place of its kind. They're the only one that uses this electric shock treatment. But in reality, the JRC is a reflection of the very same patterns of racism, of ableism, and many other forms of violence that our country has always contended with since its creation and throughout its existence. The JRC's population is 90% people of color, of all communities of color combined, collapsed into one statistic. Disaggregated, 85 to 87% of the people who are confined within the JRC are Black or Latinx or both, 85%. The JRC's population is a microcosm of the results of mass criminalization, mass incarceration, mass incarceration, I can totally speak English, I promise, and of the deeply interconnected systems of medical and penal incarceration. The JRC represents what happens when our society says that as long as someone is bad enough, as long as they are the worst of the worst, we can subject them to any conditions we like as long as we say that it is for the greater good and sometimes if we're believing ourselves to be beneficent for their own good. That is how you get the JRC. That is how the JRC happens. The JRC itself has a population that is largely funded publicly from adult adult developmental disability services funding, from school districts, out of district placement tuition funding, and increasingly through referrals from the juvenile criminal legal system. In the last 10 years, advocates have found that the JRC has actually been receiving referrals from Rikers Island Jail, the very same jail in New York City where Khalif Browder died by suicide after incarceration for years without ever even seeing a trial simply for the crime of being black and accused of a crime. Rikers Island, known as a literal torture facility, is referring to people to the JRC for treatment as a supposedly better alternative. And this really comes back to talking about how even an advocacy that is supposedly against institutionalization or against incarceration Folks are so quick to jump to praising or recommending one form of incarceration or institutionalization in place of another. Well, instead of being on Rikers Island, they'll go to JRC where it's better because they care about treating people at JRC, which is hilarious and fucking laughable. Obviously, they do not actually care about treating people because the tactics they use, they admit by their own admission, are about inflicting pain. That is the point. The entire purpose of the GED electric shock aversion therapy is to inflict pain. If it does not inflict pain, it is not in fact serving its ostensible purpose. So that's what happens, right? And in other contexts, we hear and we've heard for many years now, people who supposedly are talking about reform of the criminal legal system saying we need to build a new asylum. Asylums disappeared. The deinstitutionalization movement is what has led to this uptick in crime. It's what's led to the crisis of jails and prisons becoming our largest mental health facilities in the country. Why so many people who are incarcerated have one or more mental health diagnoses, maybe neurodivergent or mad in many different ways to put it in our parlance as advocates and activists, right? And um, The common response is, so we need to increase access to mental health treatment, whether it is a way of reducing jail population, as a way of responding to gun violence, as a way of responding to extremism. Everyone, except those in our community, will jump to say the solution to all those problems is provide more treatment. 
when we know that treatment in this context usually means coercion, involuntary treatment, forced drugging, restraint, seclusion, long-term institutionalization, denial and deprivation of control and bodily autonomy, which in turn create and reinforce further trauma. Does not help, it only traumatizes. And likewise, you'll hear from other folks say, well, you know, we're being too nice. We're providing too much nice support to people who are just, you know, committing awful crimes. They really just need to go to jail to learn their lesson because you can't hide behind a diagnosis as an excuse. And certainly we're not here. I know that, you know, Shane and I have spent hours having conversations about what does accountability look like? What kinds of punishment, if any, are ever appropriate or warranted? Well, accountability doesn't look like throw somebody in a prison. How does prison keep us safe? That is a core concept within the conversation of abolition work, right? Is that prisons do not keep us safe. Prisons do not reduce violence. Prisons are not an effective response to violence because they are in themselves a space that creates and inflicts violence. And that is to be clear, not that we're here saying that people who would like to and could benefit from receiving support should be denied support. We're not saying that people who want to go act in a horrifically violent way should be able to do that with no consequences. What we are saying is that institutionalization of any form, that incarceration of any form are not effective responses to anything. Self-injury, aggression, extreme violence will not be solved simply by relying on the same tools of ableism and racism that have already existed, that we have already tried, and that continually fail to actually solve anything about violence because their purpose is to entrench and reinforce existing systems, mechanisms, and processes of violence. But I'm going to turn it back now to Shane. Um, who's going to talk a little bit more about what advocacy actually looks like, about what it is we're fighting for, and about what we've been doing about the problem of the JRC and other forms of coercive and harmful treatment. So I'm an attorney and a policy advocate, so my most of my experience hasn't been in that capacity combined with my advocacy as a self-advocate, somebody who is autistic, who is otherwise disabled, who can say, I've been in some of these situations. Um, obviously, those things can overlap, but they're not always the same. So a lot of my experience has to do with um, legal advocacy, just so you get a sense, but that's not all that a person can do. When it comes to legal advocacy and policy advocacy, though, um, there have been many, many attempts for decades now to go after Judge Rutenberg Center and its use of aversives in particular. To a greater extent, the use of aversives has been dealt with otherwise, um, but my primary um, experience with it, particularly in the Northeast where JRC is based and gets most of its referrals from, are, uh, is um, around regulating the use of aversives at JRC in particular. Um, sometimes there will be proposed regulations or laws. Often this comes up in the context of some abuse scandal um, or of um, even worse when there's a death and somebody decides we have to do something about this and it gets tra uh, enough traction to make some progress, not a complete fix, but at least moving in the direction of getting rid of some of this stuff, prohibiting it. Um, unfortunately, um, for one thing, there hasn't been a complete ban. And in a way, this almost entrenches things further. Uh, people can say, look, we fixed the problem. It's not as bad as it used to be. Only 40 people are getting shocked instead of 200. Um, and that's still 40 too many people. Or um, alternately, well, we require all these steps to happen. There's due process behind it, except that it's a rubber stamp um, procedure, and there's no defense in a lot of these proceedings. Um, and in fact, the people who are subject to them 
for abuse, uh, for approval of abortions, don't even know that they're going to court for that. Um, and all of this even assumes that JRC or another facility is following the law, which frequently they don't, or they play fast and loose with it. They'll say, oh, yes, well, for these purposes today, we are not subject to your educational regulations. We're not a school. These kids can't learn. They need treatment. But when the Department of Human Services comes in the next week and says, why don't you have a licensed therapist on staff? Um, where's their degree or certification? They say, well, we're not really a treatment facility. We're an experiential learning program. So we don't need a psychiatrist or a licensed counselor. This person who has some kind of um, qualification that's maybe they got a degree in psychology and paid a fee, they're fine. So a lot of the problem is lack of enforcement as well as laws that aren't strong enough. Um, and the lack of enforcement problem is one of the hardest things to tackle um, in all cases of abuse and neglect. Unfortunately, um, for instance, even in the context of um, adult caregiver abuse in the community, I once contacted a the Adult Protective Services Agency in a state and was told uh, when they weren't when the caregiver wasn't allowing this guy to go out to the grocery store and get food for the family or go to his job. Um, I was told, well, if they're not tying him up in the basement, we're, uh, we can't get involved. So. It's, there's a lack of enforcement, and even when it comes to the most egregious things, there are barriers to it. Um, unfortunately, um, these organizations often have a group of parents for a period of years or decades, sometimes a rotating group of them, depending on who's in the who's um, currently at the program, who will say, this program saved my child's life, and now dare you try to close it down or limit it. My kid would be on drugs, in jail, homeless, in the backboard of an institution, dead, etc. if it weren't for this program. And often because they're parents or caregivers, the presumption is they must care about the person as themselves and have their best interests at heart and also not being misled. So unfortunately, lawmakers um, and enforcement agencies have backed down a lot of the times. Not always, though. Um, especially in Massachusetts, there is more of a chance now, um, hopefully, that a state law would ban the use of aversives entirely and it could pass. Massachusetts is important, mind you, um, for the purposes of JRC advocacy in particular, because that's where the program is located. Um, their most um, staunch defender, a legislator and the uncle of a JRC resident, is no longer in office as of 2019. Interesting fact there. Um, his brother and the father of the JRC resident said on the floor of the Massachusetts legislature that he would rather shoot his son in the head than see him released from JRC. But um, unfortunately, this was seen as how much this person cares instead of how very abusive and fucked up that is. I don't know how able people work, don't ask me, but there is a big core of a problem. Um, one of the other things that's not as good of a de development is the move to have um, insurance companies cover applied behavioral analysis, which is the behavior modification modality used for um, autistic people um, and is seen as this great treatment. Um, sometimes one argument people will make is, well, that can be useful. So these other things that aren't covered by insurance, if we build them as ADA, occupational therapy, for instance, or speech therapy, then uh, we can get the person the services they need. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going to be crying for the insurance companies um, who are trying to deny people things that they need. But it's important specifically because of the abusive history of ABA and the abusive assumptions at the bottom of it that shape how we approach autism treatment, autism education, etc. 
that we need to distinguish what we're trying to get people to do. If it's what Lavas originally intended of making somebody in, indistinguishable from their peers, that's a lot different than teaching somebody to communicate either verbally or by um, a um, AAC um, alternative and augmentative communication devices like an iPad or uh, Dynavox, I think they were called. Uh, and that's different from like helping somebody control their fine motor skills and be able to to write or draw more easily or walk in a straight line. All of these are different things and translating them actually makes it harder to sort out what's abusive, what's okay in practice, but based on the wrong assumptions for the wrong purposes and how what, what we should actually be providing for people and what they find helpful for themselves. Uh, separating that out is crucial. So challenging and offering alternatives to measures to increase funding for programs or modalities that have an history of abuse and in fact have abuse built into their DNA is another way you can go about trying to change the law, especially if you have a background in education, uh, either as a researcher or a provider, um, or if you have um, experience as either a survivor or unfortunately a more likely to be believed if you're a parent or a caregiver, if you can speak to uh, not only what's bad about what they're offering, but what's what are better alternatives. And there are some out there. Um, the one that comes to mind is floor time um, as an alternative to ABA. Um, so offering ideas of what else there is might help um, get rid of the perceived need for mo more coercive, if not outright aversive, ways of uh, providing treatment and education. Um, let's see. The other thing you can do, or advocates have also done, um, is to submit a freedom of information request to the state agencies, educational agencies, um, adult services agencies, etc., to see where um, your state is sending people and where they're funding to, and you can say hey, our state is sending 60 people to this facility that has a slew of abuse complaints that somebody died at last year. What's going on? Can you, um, maybe we should stop funding this place um, in your role as a member of the public who's represented by, uh, by um, government legislature. God, I can't speak. Uh, as a citizen, and a resident of the state, as a taxpayer, you may be able to advocate once you have that information about where the money is going and what kind of services are being provided with what quality. Um, I would also, for people, especially if they don't have a background in the disability rights community or the disability community in general, I would also do research, and I'm not, you know, saying you need to go and find all the stuff that's behind a billion paywalls that uses terminology that you need uh, several years of psychology courses to understand. I'm saying go into the community of people with these disabilities uh, and see what their experiences have, have been, what they want, and how they would most like you, especially if you're not a member of that community, to be an ally. Um, and what efforts are going on in any one given space or um, part of the larger community. Um, I would be glad to talk with people about further suggestions uh, if anybody's interested, but those are what's coming to mind for the time being. Um, so I think that's what we had planned, unless Lydia wants something else, well, excuse me, wants to say something else. Uh, we can take some questions if anybody would like. This is Lydia. Um, we are happy to take your questions now. If you have any, we are seeing all your messages come in. Um, at least I am. Shane, if you don't see it, it's just you click the comments tab. Nope, if you yeah. click the comments, then we can see all the comments that have been left. 
Well, well, thank you. This is really, really great. And and I think, uh, you know, Shane, that the, the tips that you were just uh, providing to people of the things that they can do, this is really important and, and really important to the people that we're, we're trying to reach, which is, you know, um, trying to influence change, trying to, you know, whether it's at a local level, a state level or federal level, doing things that we can to change these policies and practices. Uh, and you, you've hit on so many interesting things that I know I have questions about. Um, but I want to just remind people that are in the audience, now is a really great time uh, to ask any questions you might have. And I'll bring those up on the screen as they get asked, and we can cover some of those. But I'm sure both Jennifer and I will have some questions. But let me start off with one that just popped up here <laughs> in the chat. And this was asking if there's any, any updates on the COVID situation at JRC. Um, for one thing, unfortunately, the um, COVID pandemic has been used as an excuse by the Food and Drug Administration to not enforce its ban, adopted only a month and a half before that um, on the use of electric shock, um, which doesn't make sense and is enormously crappy. Um, the other issue, though, about how people are faring um, I don't know that, but that's another thing where I think um, a FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act request, may be useful because it may, for instance, get us reports about um, neglect, for instance, or about um, deaths in the facility as recorded by state agencies. So that may be an avenue to... Um, I would think that would be especially valuable for a journalist to... Uh, write about um, it's done just to put it on the radar. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, I've got another one here from our, our friend Alex. And uh, Alex is asking, what are we doing to expose ABA problems in Virginia? And, and I'll make that more broad as well and just say, you know, there, there's a lot of concern out there about practices. And you gave a really uh, good good overview of this, you know, um, things like ABA, which are, you know, compliance based and which have some really, um, really concerning roots and practices are happening in a lot of places. And of course, families and parents are told this is what they should be doing. Um, so, you know, one of our big interests is, is in, as an organization is getting people to move past these compliance based approaches and, and work with people. You mentioned floor time, but there's a lot of different other ways that we can be doing and other things we can do, do that are, are far more uh, respectful and, and, and work collaboratively with people. So what, what, what do you think in terms of making a change related to ABA behaviors of an ABA are entrenched in education and entrenched in other areas? How can people influence that kind of change? Um, part of it is a shift of mindset in what the goal of education is, especially treatment also, but education, uh, I mean, our education system is a combination of the Prussian military school model combined with training people to become factory workers on an assembly line. So it's all about conformity. It's all about doing what you're told. We have a model that lends itself to a behavior uh, and compliance-based approach. If uh, there are models of education, um, some of them which go back decades or, um, or more, that are not based on that. Uh, free schools, um, for instance, and I believe Montessori, that approach is more based on learning rather than fitting in and doing what you're told. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a model, I think it was in Norway, of self-directed learning that was basically meeting the kid where they are not making rules about you have to do this you have to do that but really okay what are your learning goals um how do we get you interested in this how do we get you these skills um and letting kids self-direct and act like humans instead of robots mm -hmm. um and this is even more necessary for disabled kids who don't fit into what we believe people should be let alone children mm -hmm. um so um a an approach that's based on the idea that people are different they have different goals um they have um different skills or needs and that 
one size really doesn't fit all and doesn't need to is essential to be able to attack um, modalities that rely on that assumption about what the goal is. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like there was more to the question, but I will let Lydia yeah. take over yeah. while I think of if there's anything I missed. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just ask you both as you're thinking about this. Um, you know, I know in in the case of Alex who asked this question, uh, he is meeting with lawmakers and trying to influence change. Are there resources out there that you would recommend? Because, you know, people have been led to believe that certain systems and certain types of, of you know, things like ABA are, are, you know, this is what you should be doing. Are there resources out there that you recommend for people that might be trying to convince others that, that there are better ways? This is Lydia. There are some great resources available. Uh, number one, from Broadreach Training Center, which is Emma Vanderclift Clift and Norman Munk. And number two, from Foundations for Divergent Minds, which was founded by Oswin Latimer. And both of those uh, resources are organizations and training offerings that are specifically aimed at being neurodiversity affirming and explicit and how to support autistic and other disabled children and youth uh, in particular. So I would certainly recommend those resources as just a few starting points. There are others out there as well. Um, but those are two that are actually by autistic people. Okay, fantastic. I had a question. Um, I think my son, he has a nightly disco pacing party. I think it's ended. The music was very loud up until <laughs> But um, so I go out a lot with other parents trying to talk to them about behaviorism. Um, and this is a comment I get constantly and I struggle with it. So I'm going to ask you guys. Um, and I wrote it down because I, I knew I wouldn't remember. Many say, but my child's ABA has nothing negative, no aversives. Um, it's all really positive. It's all the new kind of ABA. And I try to explain, but ABA itself is an aversive because it tells a person um, who they are needs to be changed. Do you have a suggestion about how you answer that question that, um, that to explain that positive isn't necessarily positive? Um, I would tell them to look at what the goal is of what their kid is doing or undergoing, however you want to put it, is the goal to get them to uh, communicate in a way that works for them? Um, is it letting them explore and set the rules? Or is it saying you're not going to get your stuffed animal back until you say the word dinosaur or something like that? Um, that's an, a more extreme example, um, not so much as some of them, but still more on the punitive side than what people might be thinking of. Can somebody say, I need to stop, I'm done for the day, or will they be prevented from saying no or that's enough? Um, have, I'm trying to find a way to put this analogy. Um, especially because I have experienced not full on ABA, but definitely worked with providers who treated how I reacted to things or uh, just kind of how I work as a problem. And I, you know, dealing with uh, therapy now, um, I'm thinking especially of my vision therapy work, I, am, I have to remind myself, okay, I, if, if I'm in pain, if I'm in discomfort, that's not a problem with me. I'm not a bad person. I am not failing. I'm not giving up. My therapist does not want me to be in pain or in discomfort. Uh, he cares what I think. And those are things that a good provider, whatever they call themselves, will do. Do they want to work with you? Do they are are they trying to get you to be comfortable and make you meet your goals, or are they treating you as a problem to be worked on? And if you don't like it, or if you're struggling with it, too bad. Try harder. I guess I think it's 
isn't the concept intrinsically in a verse, even if it is all positive, even if they do that, the, the whole, the whole, and I, maybe I'm not making sense, but I just feel like the whole premise that this person needs to be changed, mm -hmm. no matter how they do it. I, I, I was a behavioral problem as a child and was locked in closets and beaten with rulers and very physically attacked and abused. But I don't think that even if they'd been positive and gave me gummy bears and, you know, do what they do now, if that would have changed me feeling like I was terrible, awful, needed to change, wasn't normal. Am I making sense? Maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a degree, and I'll shut up in a moment and give the floor to Lydia if they want. Um, I think there's a degree to which, and how much of it is a semantic difference versus a actual substance one is hard to say, but between this is a goal of mine or this is something that my life would be improved by not to experience versus this is me and me need to be fixed. Um, it's, I mean, even for us autistic or otherwise neurodivergent people, we might want to be able to change certain things about how we work. I want to be able to enjoy a concert without being in pain. How do I manage my sensory input to not uh, be overstimulated and have a meltdown? How do I prepare for sensory um, experiences? How do I recognize when I need to read? or I don't want to run into walls anymore. That's not fun. How do I learn to walk in a straight line? Versus I am bad, people will not like me unless I am something other than I am. And as long as I can be read as insert identity here, that is a problem that needs to be fixed. That's the distinction and I think that it can to whether or not they mean it to. Here's a, another part, brand ignoring which is part of it. And they're like, well, that's not negative because there's no punishment in it. But to me, if a child is expressing, you know, pain or distress or whatever, and you ignore it, you're basically telling them that what they need is not, it doesn't matter. And I think that's cruel. You, no, you're not hitting them. You're not shocking them. You're not locking them in a closet. But you don't matter when you ignore them. You know, I mean, that's what you're saying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is Lydia. I would add to that, that is actually a form of abuse. That's called emotional abuse. And it's mm -hmm. called psychological abuse. And it, one of the ways it is abusive is because it is a gaslighting form of abuse. Yeah. It's saying to someone, your pain doesn't exist. It's not real. We're pretending it's not there which teaches someone not only not to trust their own perceptions, but that their expressions of pain or distress will never be believed or taken seriously and may even be directly used against them. I would also add, um, just back to that original question, like can positive only still be bad? Um, one way that it is, right, is, and I a lot of other autistic people talk about us. Um, I think that our who... Uh, runs the M Ultra Ink and Daggers page has talked about it. Our friend Eric Warwick has talked about it. I think Kassiana Asasamasu and Oswin Latimer, many others have talked about this, right? Is that ABA holds hostage the things that you care about. And that's always the phrase that other autistic activists use, right? The wow. ABA yeah. holds hostage what you love. And if it holds hostage what you love by making you have to earn what it is that you like or what you love, that is also a form of abuse. So technically it's positive mm -hmm. because it's not a punishment of taking something away. It's not a punishment of inflicting something on someone, but it is still emotional abuse because it is withholding from someone perhaps what is the only thing they find comforting or pleasurable. And it is forcing that person to have to conform to whatever expectation you set just at a few minutes of time with that thing. And they learn that they shouldn't ever share what they like or care about because it will be used against them. Yeah. Okay. I like that. That's a, yeah. that, that verbiage is great. Is that, yeah. yeah. Amazing, amazing insight. Um, I want to go to a, another question here. 
Um, we have a question uh, from a professional talking about being in the mental health field and, and the current state of the system. And the question is, how do social workers who work in clinical settings begin to buck the system and link um, with disabled clients? Um, and so that's that's the question. How can people inside of systems help to um, help to bring about change? Oh, Shane, I think you're muted still. Yeah. It is just, technology is not my friend today. Um, I see somebody furry. <laughs> yes. Um, one of the things I would uh, go back to is not only make contact, but keep contact with members of the disability community, um, disability justice community, and people who have direct experience with the system, like psychiatric survivors, for instance. Um, so that's more in the psychosocial disability um, sphere um, than the education sphere, for instance. Um, another thing is, and I see this as an attorney, and it's easier for me sometimes because I've had to do this for myself, but if you're already thinking about this um, so much the better, you're probably on your, the way to being in the same place. Remind other people that just because a person is disabled or has a diagnosis doesn't make everything they do a symptom, let alone a problem. Sometimes things are just human things. Um, I had to tell judges and um, doctors that getting in a car accident isn't a symptom of schizophrenia. Um, dressing in a short skirt um, and a low cut um, blouse does not mean that you are you have poor judgment just because you might have an intellectual disability you're not at risk of sexual exploitation any more than a neurotypical person is and if you are at risk of abuse that's because of sexual abusers not because you for whatever reason decided what to wear that day I have had to remind people and I think that's an important part of being a professional um, is reminding other professionals that one, people have the right to do what they want if they're not hurting other people, and that doesn't stop the moment you get a diagnosis, and two, some things are reasonable as soon as you stop looking at them from the idea of this person is damaged or broken, um, and reminding pe other people who have forgotten that, uh, um, over and over again if you have to um, and asking them implicitly or otherwise what would you like somebody to do to you or for you or with you if you were on the other side of this interaction right good uh, so that, that kind of segues into this as well which is what advice do you have for students who are anti-ABA, but are going through pro-ABA programs to get into helping and caring professionals. Um, so especially disabled students who are anti-ABA who are training to go into these professions. And, and I think if I'm understanding that right, you know, I, I've actually met people that have uh, gone through ABA training and they went through it because they didn't believe in the things that were being done in ABA and wanted to, wanted to change it from the inside. Um, any, any thoughts on that? This is Liddy. A lot of activists talk about the difference between what we call inside game and outside game, which are basically exactly what they sound like on the tin. Inside game is when someone who is committed to a particular movement or a cause chooses to work at least apparently within a particular system or institution to attempt to disrupt or undermine it and perhaps move it toward sucking less basically from the inside <laughs> and outside game again is exactly what it sounds like is when we work from outside a particular institution or outside a particular system to attempt to change it or demand that it be changed and there are a lot of arguments within activist and organizing communities about when, whether, and to what extent it is beneficial, desirable, or even ethically permissible to play the inside game. But my advice to other people who are thinking about it is that at the end of the day, 
you and the people that you are accountable to in your work are the ones who can determine whether working from the inside game in a particular way makes sense, what that looks like and what the limit of that is. Like what is the way in which you can work the inside game and what is the point at which you have to leave because you cannot continue it without being compromised in an unacceptable way. Mm-hmm. And someone who doesn't know you and doesn't know your work and doesn't know the community that you come from and the communities that you are accountable to cannot be the person trying to dictate to you what those boundaries look like because they don't know. They don't have enough information. Also, hello, beautiful kit, and I love you. You are beautiful. <laughs> I want to hug you, and you're tolerating being cuddled. You are. What a gorgeous kitten. Yes, so wonderful. Um. Anyway, also, we were talking about uh, uh, things. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, I think it sounds to me, and I'm not the guest that didn't get asked the question, but... Uh, if you're, if it's traumatizing to on the patient or the the child or the person, because it's not just children, uh, it's going to be traumatizing for the person who's on the inside seeing it occurring. So, I mean, I I think of a secondary post traumatic stress. If you if you're on the inside or you're you know you're around it a lot, it's it's not mm-hmm. going to be harmless just because you're not the one on whom it's being used. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, there's two aspects to this. On the one hand, often there is a, de- a degree to which the working conditions are far from ideal and, in fact, lend themselves to abuse and neglect, um, as well as putting providers at risk. Um, JRC is, again, a kind of the er example. Um, they hire almost entirely staff of color. Um, some of them recent immigrants um, from um, poor countries, some of whom don't even speak English all that much of it all. And they put them in a space with people who have high support needs. I don't think that training would fix the situation. I think that there's too much broken, but they don't receive even the training that they would need to help people um, at all in any way. Um, and at the height of JRC's um, JRC-ness, for the lack of other terms, their um, their staff is being monitored um, themselves on camera all the time and told what to do at home, like how to behaviorize their families and live their life according to JRC. This is the kind of stuff why I consider Matthew Israel, a failed cult leader. Um, but off of that tangent, um, the other thing, though, is that the system that we have, the mindset, um, the system of ableism, the assumptions lead to dehumanization, um, which makes it easier to do, to justify to yourself that. Um, you know, either these people don't experience pain, which is actually a thing that got said at an FDA hearing about electric shock, um, and to, uh, well, some variation of you have to be cruel to be kind, or uh, this hurts me more than it hurts them, and it's all about, you know, means, uh, the ends justify the means, Uh, or it's outright dehumanization. These people can't be controlled by any other means, um, or you don't know what it's like to work with these people, which is something you hear from a lot of um, facility staff. And even though they're using the word people, what I hear when people are saying that is animals, because that construction always means that they don't really consider them to be people like the other side of the conversation. Um, so I think that in uh, staff are set up to be abusive in our current system where they're often marginalized themselves and underpaid, certainly, and thrown the, you know, like into the water, sink or swim. And also the environment and the mentality teaches them to do and justify terrible things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's a really nice transition into this next question. A uh, question from Emma. And uh, the question is, how can paraprofessionals, 
uh, stop restraint and seclusion from happening in special education if we do not hold a lot of power at our workplace and can easily be replaced by someone else who's willing to restrain uh, the child? This is Lydia. For me, as someone who also has worked, not in that specific context, but as a lawyer, and so faces similar questions sometimes, where in, you know, in a professional or legal context, it might be, well, if we don't do this particular thing or go along with it, maybe the institution will find somebody else who won't be as confrontational. So for me, when you are in the inside game position, it's not enough just to say, we're not doing this but to also you have to offer an actual alternative. So for example, instead of, well, I'm just not gonna restrain the child who perhaps for the sake of this hypothetical, the particular child who may have a disability, who is actively physically lashing out at other children, like punching and kicking other kids. And the other teachers are asking you and the other paraprofessionals, you need to restrain this child. You can say, I'm not going to restrain this child, but you still need to do something about the fact that the particular child is kicking and punching at other children. That may be attempt to get the other children out of the room into a separate room. It may be if you offer a punching bag, which frankly, classrooms should have them available, punching bags, punching mats, so that the child can continue kicking and punching, but no actual people will be harmed. There's even some company that I blanked on the name of, but I'm not actually trying to shill for them or whatever, but there's some company that manufactures these blocking shields that are explicitly meant as an alternative to trying to restrain children. And some of them have arm straps on them yep. so that a teacher or a paraprofessional, you can put it on your body so that way you can just make yourself the target as opposed to say other teachers, other students, but then you're also not technically the target. The big thing that it's safe to punch is the target. And, and this is one example, right? Like a specific situation might be different depending on what is the reason that other teachers want to restrain a child. And sometimes it's, it's often, as we know, it's not just because they're kicking or punching people. It's sometimes you're disobedient. I don't like your voice. You didn't do what I said you wanted to do. I don't like what you're wearing today. If you said a swear word, oh, you jumped out of your seat. All these other reasons that are not even an actual act of physical violence that children get restrained for anyway. But yep. but basically all that comes down to is my suggestion for you, if you are the paraprofessional, what your position is, is you may not be able to just say no, no, no. You can say no, but. And yeah. Another yeah. aspect of it is, uh, what happens before they're anywhere close to lashing out physically? Uh, like not even the step before that, but five steps before that. Uh, again, I worked a lot in psych wards with uh, as a um, public defender, and I had a lot of clients who were alleged to be violent. Um, you know, they're dangerous and aggressive. The closest any of my clients got to violence towards me was a woman who slammed her hand on um, a, 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 the table during conversation and screamed at me to get away. I was never, you know, attacked or assaulted. People would always say, oh, are you sure you want to, you know, have the door closed with this person? And I said, do they want the door closed? And <laughs> even that kind of thing and, uh, uh, was helped to prevent um problems because i was letting them set their boundaries or not set boundaries as they chose it, everything from where do you want to sit do you want to sit with your back to a wall or do you want to sit at the table the, the chair with your back to the door um do you want if somebody wants to turn the light off or it looks uncomfortable i might suggest that give somebody as much autonomy as possible um and again treat them like an equal human being who has needs and preferences some of them more um yeah. crucial or severe as it were but like again um neurotypical people have that too um so really before a problem starts 
even if you've read, you know, somebody's IEP or their psychiatric evaluation that says, blah, 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 they're aggressive, they're self-insurious, come into the interaction with an open mind and be ready to interact with them as you would any other person and work through with them. Okay, I've heard that you're struggling with this. How would you like to approach it? Or what can I do to prevent that before it happens? Yeah, it's amazing what happens when you approach things from a from a standpoint of connection or compassion over compliance. And, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, I mean, you bring up such important points about one being proactive. There's so much you can do to avoid getting to a situation that escalates into a crisis. And if you can prevent crisis from ever occurring, you prevent the need from using these kinds of things. And I love your advice on uh, to the paraprofessional, which is, you know, you may not be in the position of power. But, you know, even as parents, you know, I've provided to IEP teams copies of books with better approaches and, and ways that I think that they could work with my child in a way that's going to be, you know, not lead them to those kind of situations. So, yeah, that, that, that's really great advice. I want to let people know we've got time for a couple more questions here, but it is getting late. So we'll, we'll probably have to wrap this up here shortly. And I, Jennifer, I can tell by the look on your face that you have a question. <laughs> so go I'm ahead. Trying not to ADHD blurt. Um, so I, and I have an answer to that para as well, because I was the, you know, the problem child in the room and threw a fit every day. And it took almost four years of school for a teacher to figure out that I was having my meltdowns right before reading group every day. And it was because I didn't want to read aloud because I was dyslexic and I couldn't read. And when she you know, tutored me intensively and everything. But basically she figured out what the problem was. As soon as the problem was solved, my behaviors, the meltdowns ended. So it's, it's, yeah, you figure out that's that, that was way, way after the fact. If someone had figured it out three years sooner, I would have spent a hundred hours less in closets. So, um, yeah, absolutely. So, so I, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is by, especially if you are assumed to be non-disabled, if you can pass as neurotypical and non-disabled, you're setting an example for the other adults who are non-disabled in the room, especially if it works. But even just because, you know, people will believe you more if you're like them in age and how you communicate and act. So by treating other people as equals, including children, including nonverbal people, including elders with dementia, for instance, you're setting the tone. And especially if it's successful, people might adopt that because it's better than making somebody mad until they hit you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have a question for you. You, you know, I know you're both attorneys. Um, do do either of you or have you represented people in in you know you know families or individuals in cases related to restraint seclusion or other other adversives? Yep. Okay. Um, I represented somebody at JRC um, who was a young woman. Um, uh, she was Afro Latinx. Um, and had fetal alcohol syndrome disorder, uh, spectrum disorder, excuse me, and a few other disabilities associated. And she was at JRC for a grand total of three months and got, um, so that's about 90 days and got restrained 46 times during that period. Uh, and it culminated in a situation where um, staff on a bus, um, five people restrained her and one of them punched her in the face. Um, what was interesting was that they all know, they all knew where the cameras were. Mm -hmm. Um, it was done in a way where you couldn't see exactly what happened, but, uh, you could hear, oh my, ow, my eye, my eye, and then she leaning over and covering her face. But the, the really, and, and it was especially um, obvious to me or apparent that um, it was 
knowingly done in such a way because the person responsible had been working there for 10 years uh, and was clearly leading the show. So he knew how to conceal what was going on. Um, I also worked on a large number of um, cases that were kind of squished into one case, a class action, but not a class action against a um, so-called emotional growth boarding school up in Oregon for 20 years of emotional, physical, and sexual child abuse against people with everything from um, trauma over the loss of their parents to academic problems to um, um, addiction. Um, and that was a wild case, uh, which mm -hmm. I will not go off into because it would take all night. <laughs> all right. I have a question for you. Um, a, we, a very heated topic on our page uh, that almost devol always devolves into rage between uh, uh, people on the page. Um, segregated education for special education. Um, how do you guys feel about self-contained classrooms and special ed schools? Do you do you prefer the idea of fully accommodated inclusion education, or do you think uh, segregated special ed classrooms are better? So I have a couple of responses to that. One of them is what really matters is who's in control. For example, the deaf community is pretty unanimous. Deaf many, many, if not most deaf people want there to be deaf specific schools that yeah. are that are consisting of primarily, if not only, deaf students. And the reason why such schools can exist without necessarily being inherently abusive is that a good deaf school is so led by deaf administrators and deaf teachers as well as serving deaf students. But most self-contained special classrooms, the way that we talk about it, are mm -hmm. run by non-disabled teachers, non-disabled paraprofessionals, and in schools that are controlled by non-disabled administrators. And they are places where disabled children are sent without necessarily having a say in the matter. And it's not about preserving disabled culture or disabled community connections or of teaching disabled pride. It's about containing, that's literally in the name, mm -hmm. disabled students somewhere else apart from non-disabled students. But the second thing I have to say about this question, right, is I don't actually like to talk about a model of accommodated education. All education should be access-centered, which mm -hmm. means that we recognize that every student, whether they're disabled or not, has individual needs, capacities, interests, desires, things that they're going to be good at, things they're going to be bad at, things they need support with, things they'll do faster, things they'll do slow and will take more time. And therefore, all education for every student should be individualized, mm -hmm. tailored to that student's strengths, the ways in which that student learns, and offer opportunities for that student to be challenged on their terms and to be given ways to be good at things and learn how to be good at things and how to get good at things also on their terms. And that shouldn't be done only for disabled students. First of all, it usually isn't, even though it's theoretically supposed to be done. And secondly, where it's assumed that most people can meet the mold, whatever the mold is of abled, normal, whatever, and everybody else just has to catch up or else we're, we don't care about you, whatever sucks to be you. And so the model of education that I wanna see is one where students have maximal autonomy, where the model of teaching and learning is access centered and where students can decide for themselves if they want to be in a classroom or a school model that prioritizes and centers students that share certain parts of their identity, including disabled identity, or if they want to be in a school or a program that isn't necessarily centered around that shared identity or experience. But I don't think we're there yet. Yeah, no, I don't think we are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, certainly some elements of like universal design in, in, in what you're talking about, but is there anyone out there that you've seen that's doing something better than, I mean, what we're doing? I, th I think that, um, you know, what what we've talked about in what exists today is a long way from that kind of environment. I mean, even kids with individual education plans, we know how, how, how individualized they are often. <laughs> so is there anybody out there that's doing something better? Or, you know, I mean, I, I've met educators that have been doing far better things, but is are there any systems or any countries that you've seen good examples? 
it seems like it's really that kind of thing where it's a one-off, you know, one school has it down or, or one um, one teacher really has the right idea. And it's not always, you know, they know all the right terms and they are, you know, super advocacy oriented. Sometimes people just get it because they get it. Often it's because they're neurodivergent and they may or may not know it, but some people just are naturally good at knowing what works either for individual people or just how to deal with other humans who may or may not be like them. Um, but our current model doesn't prioritize that. And I think as a result, uh, that's going to be, it's going to be harder to do anything but find anecdotes. Um, let's see, I, I had another thought. Um, one thing I did want to go back and add uh, earlier is regardless of what setting somebody is in, let them know that they have a disability um, or that they're neurodivergent, however you want to frame it, and let the educators know what their access needs are and that they exist and that they're not problems, you know, this kid isn't just picky or hyper or whatever, and give kids access to their identity is because if any, if nothing else, it's how they'll know other, how to, how to find and older uh, and give them access to a wider community and the language to explain their needs rather than, yeah, I guess I'm just a weird kid who can't get their shit together and it's disorganized and lazy and stupid. Mm -hmm. um, so I have one last question from our audience, uh, and this gets to the question of trauma. And of course, you, uh, Lydia, made a uh, really impactful statement when you said that you know um, about trauma itself being a disability. Um, and you know what we certainly find in the use of things like restraint, seclusion, suspension, expulsion, corporal punishment is that kids that this is happening to, kids that are getting pushed down that school to prison pipeline are more often than not kids that do have trauma uh, in their background. So the question here from Judy is, how do we start to heal trauma from restraints and seclusion? Either you have any thoughts on kind of addressing the uh, the trauma after these things have happened. And of course, you know, what, one of the things that we've learned is that, you know, trauma is a cycle. And, and when people are traumatized, uh, you know, they're more apt to be hypervigilant in the future and more apt to be on a state of alert and more apt to sometimes then be restrained and secluded again. Um, so yeah. any thoughts on how to address that? End it. Uh, I mean, that's the ideal thing on the, I, I'm not quite sure if you're talking about healing, like on the end of working with people or healing as working on oneself. Um, I am still working on the latter. Um, I don't know if I will ever feel really like the other shoe is not going to drop. It's not been the case that I can depend on it. So that's a big barrier for me that, you know, I'm going to get ditched or somebody I trust is going to let me know that I'm not actually okay and might in fact abuse me. Like, I'm still working on how to come to terms with that, but I think in working with others who have that same experience, providers and teachers, one needs to be aware that there's a good chance that the person they're going to work with who has an IEP, who has a disability, especially one that's associated with abuse um, as a result or as it's more likely that somebody from that guy, that um, community will be abused at some point in their life to work from the perspective that the person is a trauma survivor. There's nothing to lose by right. saying this person has probably seen some shit um, as opposed to saying, assuming the opposite. Um, again, giving somebody as much autonomy and control over their situation as possible can help a person trust you to the extent that trust is possible in a situation for them at that period of time. Um, and 
also giving them the time to heal and recognizing that it's not going to be overnight. It might not be for decades. Um, unfortunately, there's a tendency to be like, you know, get over it, um, fuck up, whatever. And or even to say, well, you can only change if you want to change and as if it's a voluntary process. Um, and like that alone can be really alienating can tell the person oh this is another person who thinks i'm i'm intrinsically wrong that i'm a problem when are they gonna hurt me um or when are they gonna allow me to be hurt so accepting the person as they are and validating them to the extent possible might not heal them completely but especially the younger they are the fewer times they've had to get burned the better of a possibility it's going to be that you can teach somebody that not all people and in fact it might only be a few assholes you meet um relatively speaking um and the earlier that is and the more you go to bat for them and try to convince other people to act the same way towards them, either by example or by telling them, the better chance you have of having somebody who recovers from PTSD instead of developing or exacerbating full-blown complex PTSD, which is a whole bigger, messier problem. Yeah, that, that, that's good advice. You know, I, I think back to my son going through restraint and seclusion. And one of the important things I think that that we did was I had a conversation with him and, and talked to him that this should not have happened to him. It was not OK the way that he was he was treated. And I think, you know, um, understanding people's perspectives and their feelings and, and being seen and heard, I think, is so important to to recovery. But, you know, there are people that have gone through many many instances of these things and um it's tough it's a tough road to recover and, and trust and you know I, I i always say with education um you know i have i have three r's to education their relationship 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 because it's so critical in helping all children succeed and, and and i love the context that you put so much of this in tonight so at this point i, I, I want to thank you um lydia oh. and shane for for your time this evening this has Can been a say one more thing Sure, absolutely. I was going to ask you if you had any final thoughts. So go ahead. Another thing about helping people um, recover from trauma or just building respectful uh, learning communities and relationships is if you screw up, apologize. Not, I'm sorry if I offended you or like that, like I know you felt this way, but I was trying to do my best to say, wow, I lost my temper. Um, I won't do that again. That wasn't cool of me. I know you don't have to forgive me. I know you're upset. You don't have to talk about it, but I realize I was wrong. Or ultimately, like, wow, I never knew that that was going to hurt somebody. I hadn't seen that before. How can I do better? Um, it might not take away the hurt, but it can, again, show that somebody's willing to do better, that people are good and they're not malicious or callous and it all it it also just i lost my train of thought but it's just good practice um especially in dealing with marginalized populations uh who are not going to get that reaction in helping them establish what should be and setting their expectations and boundaries going forward in other relationships mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Lydia, any, any final thoughts or, or um, uh, words of, of advice or wisdom? You know, in thinking through what our world might look like, um, where restraint, seclusion, and other forms of forced treatment or institutionalization aren't the norm anymore, it again brings me back to the answer I gave to that earlier person question of what would the alternative be? What can we offer instead? And I don't claim to have the answer to that. I think it's too big for any one person to say, I personally have all the answers for what it should look like. But I do think that there's a lot of excellent work out there already that young people, that queer people of color, 
that multiply marginalized disabled people are doing for building learning and teaching spaces and accountability practices rooted in transformative justice principles to begin to show us what it would look like if we could expand that work to be much more global and much more all encompassing. And that's where I want to be. That's great. That's Beautiful. great. Uh, you you are both extremely inspiring, and and this has been really really informative. Uh, would love to would love to have you back and have more discussions about this. And and you know again, um, you know I think here at the Alliance, um, you know we're really interested in and collaborating and working with other people that are doing amazing work to try to influence some larger changes. And uh, just appreciate the the dedication, all the work that you have, have been doing. Uh, Jennifer, uh, I wanna thank you for being here tonight and see if you have any final words as we wrap up. Um, I, I, I was thinking about that last question, what can you do to heal? And for me, um, uh, healing comes through activism um, with my son who was re also restrained and secluded, we filed a federal lawsuit. So I'm telling him that, um, what happened to you is not okay. And we're, and we're showing him that. So I think making it stop is the way to, to heal from it, at least for me and hopefully for him as well. Yeah. And I, I think that's why we're all here. I mean, we've got yeah. a, an amazing community of people out there and, um, you know, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but but thank mm -hmm. you so much again, Lydia and Shane. Uh, this has been amazing, and really appreciate um, you taking the time to talk to us tonight. So, with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you both go and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. And I've got a couple quick announcements here. So, thank you again, and we hope that uh, we'll be able to have you back here. Thank you. Yes. Bye, Kitty. <laughs> bye. 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 Take care. All right. So thank you again for joining us. This, is, this has been a really uh, informative session and, and hopefully, uh, you know, have you thinking about a lot of things. Uh, this is, you know, really, um, really been fantastic. So I hope everybody's enjoyed it. I do want to let you know that we've got um, we've got more great presentations coming up soon as well. Uh, and we are back in the new year and we will be going back into our uh, regular schedule here of events. So that means every two weeks. Uh, this evening's was a little later than normal, but um, you know we typically do those every other Thursday around 3.30 Eastern time. Our next event, we're going to be talking to Dr. Lori Desitels, who talks about, and, and I think I even mentioned this, this wording earlier, Connections Over Compliance. Uh, and her uh, she's got a book, which is called Connections Over Compliance, Rewiring Our Perceptions of Discipline. Uh, we're gonna interview Lori and talk about that new book and her work related to neuroscience and how we can make things uh, better uh, in our classrooms and in working with children. So uh, that is it for us today. Uh, this will be available on Facebook, YouTube, and as an audio podcast. Thank you so much for being part of our community and joining us. And I, I encourage you, please share these presentations. Um, the more we can raise awareness about the, the issues that we're working with and the, the change that we want to make in the world, uh, the better our luck will be in doing that. So thank you so much. I'm going to end the broadcast here and we'll see you again next time.